I'm Katie Stover, Director of Reader Services for the Kansas City Public Library. Welcome to Hellsberg Auditorium in our majestic central library. Before I introduce our esteemed guests, I want to point out that Central Library will be the location for the first annual Heartland Book Festival. The festival begins Friday, October 6th with a keynote address from Jermaine Fowler, author of the Humanity Archive. And this event will be at the Folly Theater. On Saturday, here at Central, the library welcomes Karen Slaughter, author of the Will Trent Thriller series, as well as a plethora of well-known regional and local authors. There's something for readers of all ages at the Heartland Book Festival. I hope you pick up one of the schedules on your way out. And now to move on to tonight's event. I am honored and delighted to be sitting with photojournalist B.A. Van Sys and one of the subjects of his latest exhibit, Invited to Life, Alan J. Hall. You can view the exhibit in the Goldner Gallery on the second floor of Central Library. It is stunning. And we have the library's exhibits curator, Craig Augie, to thank for the organization and staging of this beautiful exhibit. BA presents as a very serious artist and writer. <laughs> Just take a look at his accomplishments. You've seen his photographs in the National Portrait Gallery of the Smithsonian, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Museum of Jewish Heritage. He has had solo exhibitions at Los Angeles Center for, Photo for Photography, the Center for Jewish Heritage, and Factory Gallery of New York City, just to name a few. B.A. has published collections of his work, Children of Grass and Invited to Life, both highlighted here at KCPL. And his other published work ranges from travel essays to poetry to reviews and criticism, and has appeared in Atlas Obscura, the Los Angeles Review, the New York Journal of Books, and my personal favorites, BuzzFeed and The Village Voice. Seriously, he's been everywhere, man. <laughs> Joining BA in tonight's conversation is a man of many letters, Alan J. Hall. He holds degrees in law and engineering. He is Professor Emeritus of Kennesaw State University and the author of a memoir, Hiding in Plain Sight, and if you notice the QR code as you enter the auditorium on the computer screen in the back, a quick scan will take you to an electronic version of Alan's book. Alan is a Holocaust survivor, one who has chosen love for a life path. It is evident in the career he shares with his wife, Lori. Both are marriage mediators. Like most survivors, Alan has a terrible story to share, but he willingly, eagerly, shares it with everyone, employing compassion, wisdom, and warmth as he does so. B.A. wanted to capture those qualities when he photographed Alan and Lori. So tonight, we're invited to share life with B.A. Van Sys and Alan J. Hall. Good evening and welcome, gentlemen. Before anything else, I want to apologize. Uh, you said that I was going to present as a very serious person. If I had known that this man was going to wear strawberry socks, I wouldn't have dressed like I was going to a funeral. I apologize to all of you. <laughs> I want to start by asking, how did you two come together for this project? Uh, so it was on the hookup site Craigslist. No, uh, so, I, uh, so it originally started, I had in 2016... It's going to take me a thousand words. I'm going to try and do it as fast as I can. Uh, in 2016, I was working for The Village Voice, the best newspaper there ever was. <laughs> and uh, I had pitched my editor at the time on doing a story about what refugee wives in America look like. At the time, there was a man running for president who was talking a lot about refugees, and they're not sending their best people, and we want to build a wall to keep us free. And I wanted to explore what refugee wives looked like in America at the latter end, what those contributions had been or not been, et cetera. And so I pitched my editor on that, and I said, uh, I'd like to maybe photograph 12 people who have a refugee background, but not from what people usually expect. And the, the right cadre for that at the time, it felt, was uh, Holocaust survivors. I originally thought about Cuban migrants who come over uh, after the Civil War in 5960, and they just weren't quite seasoned enough. Uh, but then I realized there's this whole group of people who had come over after the war who had sort of a unique trauma bonding experience would be interesting to explore. Uh, I set out to do 12 of them, 
And uh, there's a quote I like to steal for this. There's, I, I know the woman who runs March of the Living these days, which is a group where they bring survivors and their descendants to, to Poland every year to do essentially a, a visibility march. And she was asking me how I got into this last year when I was talking with her. And uh, I got to about this point in the conversation. She stopped me and said, let me guess. You fell in love. And I said, yes, I did. Uh, what happens is if you meet 12 Holocaust survivors, you photograph 37. And there's the show that went up then at the time, The Village Voice collapsed beneath me while I was working on this project, not my fault. Uh, <laughs> and the Museum of Jewish Heritage said, well, you've got all these portraits. Can we make them the exterior of the museum for a few years? Which is what they did. I had a terrible time doing that project. Awful time. I had been in my earlier life, uh, for a couple of years, a first grade teacher for about three years. And so many of the survivors who I'd met had been children. And I approached it talking about, well, tell me about your experience. And all the stories start with, well, I'm seven and hiding in a hole, which is the experience. You know, I know seven. I know seven very well. It was, it was, that was challenging to deal with. I put it behind me, mostly because I didn't want to spend my whole life like listening to klezmer music and crying. And then during the pandemic, I found myself thinking absolutely constantly about the Holocaust survivors I had met not about necessarily what they'd been through in the war, but the inherent strength that they all had. The joy that I'd found in them in spite of the narrative I had been talking about the first time I'd done it. And I picked up during the pandemic a contract with Getty to go around and photograph all the various fun things, the protests, people throwing rocks, being violent, all that crazy stuff in 2020. And I got this idea to just call up every Holocaust museum I could find in America and say, hey, could you connect me with some Holocaust survivors? I'm going to be driving around the country, and I'm not getting rocks thrown at my car. It'd be nice to sit down with some, some survivors, because I realized that you know, I, like everyone else, have been totally gutted by the pandemic. Um, but I knew a lot of folks who'd lost absolutely everything and rebuilt, and I wanted to talk to them. Out of an absolute sheer greed, I wanted to meet all these folks. And all of the museums. Uh, came back and said, are you nuts? There's a pandemic on. Everybody is 98 years old. No one's going to sit with you. And I asked 100 and, uh, actually the exact number, I asked 105 people and 103 said yes. And uh, one of them was a guy named Alan Hall. He wears strawberry socks. It's infuriating. <laughs> um, who I was put in, actually I wasn't even put in touch with. Uh, one of the museums in Florida said, you need to go find this guy. He's fun. And then I said, how do I get a hold of him? And they said, eh, find him. And so I looked you up in the phone book, a thing that still exists, and, and I cold called you. That's how I did it. What and do you remember, I came Alan? down and I sat, <laughs> and I sat with Alan uh, and, and lovely Lori in their home in Florida. And we sat for hours and chatted. It will be like this, but less of audience. And it was just you know, like, like so many of the folks who I met, you know, uh, sorry, Lori, I fell in love. And so that's how it was. What do you remember, Alan? <laughs> Bob. I remember that <laughs> B.A. came with his lady, Robin. And I don't remember sitting for a long time talking because they said, may we take some photographs of you? Next thing I know, screens come up, lights come out, etc. And we started talking. And while we are having this very pleasant conversation, BA says, with your permission, can I take photographs? I said, sure, of course. And so as we're chatting, the click, 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 click all over it. And that was a little different. But anyway, I'm used to that because this is not the first time I have been interviewed. So then after perhaps an hour and a half or two hours, B.A. says, you've had a long time. You're tired, which I wasn't. Uh, let's take a break. And during the break, we're having fun. We're talking. Lori and I chimes in, and we, I don't know, we're just having a, a great time. And again, he's clicking, which I don't mind. That's perfectly OK. And then we go back to the formal thing. And maybe 15 minutes later or half an hour later, he says, we're done. Now, we have become friends. And we've seen him in New York, et cetera. And whenever we're in New York, we try to reach out to him. So we're done. 
And uh, we, uh, when we meet in New York, he says, well, I just want you to know my style, the way I operate. OK, tell us. Oh, shit. <laughs> he says, all that formal stuff with the background and lights, etc., goes out the window. Sure. It's the 15 minutes that is the informal fun stuff, that's what he focuses on. And so when you look at the pictures downstairs, that at least in my case, that's what you're seeing. I think uh, Lori and I are collectors of art. She says we're accumulators whatever you want to call us. We, uh, we love art, and I've seen much work by other photographers. This man's a genius. And I just want so, to say, stop, he's first, stop. He's phenomenal. His stop. work is incomparable. Stop. <laughs> Don't interrupt me while I'm interrupting you. <laughs> quiet, quiet. You're a child. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, yeah, you see the relationship. And Folks, I want to let you know that the, the photos you're seeing scrolling, these are not in the exhibit downstairs. These are photos that Craig chose just for this event. And you can see what Alan's talking about, the whimsical, hopeful nature in these photos. So to, now that he's outed me, uh, part of that's true. Uh, actually, that, that's mostly true. Um, <laughs> what, what I really like to do, a tremendous number of the photographs in this and all my other projects, now that you've put it on the internet forever, where everyone's going to know, I'm a liar. Um, I, it's true. Um, I, I begin all my shoots by saying, I'm, I, give me a couple minutes, I've got to figure out the lights. And I'm taking pictures while I'm figuring out the lights. Uh, I've been a photographer for 20 years. I know the lights. Um, <laughs> everything's already got out the, the gate. And so, but what happens is that people who think they're consciously posing will be consciously posing. And so a lot of times, the picture that's of them in the gallery downstairs, it's, I think it's her fixing him because he was schmutzy. Which she did to me, by the way, before I came out today. She's like, "You're schmutzy because you got schmutz on you." And so, um, but th like that—that that often is the time when people are really uh, alive in who they actually are. It's especially important with Holocaust survivors. There is a genre of Holocaust survivor photography. There's two folks who've come before me. I won't name them because this is the internet is forever. But um, who have made a big body of work of making Holocaust survivors look weak and old and pathetic, um, and it's not really who they are. I, I know 140 survivors, it's not. And old, so, yes. Old, old, <laughs> yeah. Old, 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 you can't stop. The rest of it's different. And so for me, it was important to introduce uh, the, the audience of the work to the actual people I'd met. And that the easiest way to do that is to be testing the lights. Because like you said, this isn't your first rodeo. And people have a certain thing they expect. They want everyone to show up and go, <laughs> and be sad and old and pathetic, and, and, and not, wear, not wear strawberry socks under any circumstances. And so uh, you know, that's, that's something you always want to get away from, because yeah, you try and be an artist, but also you do want to try and tell a story that resembles the truth as you encounter it and see it. You interrupted me. I'm going to pay the same back to yeah, you. Yeah, buddy, let's do it. Uh, the other thing he, what he does is just phenomenal. A man takes no notes. And his photography are stills, so he has no record. We, while we are talking, he's got a, if there is such thing, I don't, I don't know what the term is. He's got a photographic mind about what's being said. And the, the, the descriptions that you read downstairs, I never had a chance to review prior to the book being written. Every million years. He's got a memory that scares me. <laughs> now, as he remembers everything that you said, for better or for worse, and some of it, thank God, not all of it, appears down in the print. In the print. So, Alan, you said to me that this collection of portraits of Holocaust survivors is like nothing you'd ever seen before, and you'd seen quite a few. Yes. How is it different to you? I think he captures people. Uh, now, most other photographers see us as the poor survivors of this tragedy. Indeed, it was a tragedy. But there is, and we are survivors, but there's nothing poor about us. We are, I consider every day of my life, 
as a bonus. I was supposed to die over and over and over again. And so I am probably one of the richest people you have ever met. Every day of my life is a gift. Nothing poor about me. This is the only man that understands that. My agent, everyone. <laughs> B.A., what were some of the adjectives that sprang to mind when you saw Alan's portrait when it was finished? And why does it have a white background? I, I get a lot of crap from every curator about why it's white. Um, and so we there, love it. <laughs> there is there's a reason for it. Um, the so I knew uh, the second that I had Alan's picture. My memory does not quite match his. I'm sure his is correct, but mine is also correct. Um, <laughs> which is which is I don't recall it's actually photographed for me that long because I knew. I knew out of the can when she started fixing your clothing that that was how I had to have it. I, that was what it was. There was nothing else to it. I made other pictures, but I'm not even sure I even looked at them. Actually, I'm almost positive I didn't. Um, his background is white, and this touches on a question I think you're going to ask me later anyway, but the, the, the conversation I had with him was down in Miami. This had been about around like uh, June or so of 2020. And the absolute most unpleasant, uh, for certain reasons, interview that I had had was immediately before his, <laughs> immediately. Did this, this person's interview, and it was very challenging, and it was problematic, and then I went to his, and my own emotion entered into it. Uh, and there, I, I had come from a, a story that I knew was going to be hard to tell or couldn't tell to one that had a lot of light in it. So. There's no backdrop, I don't think. I think it's actually just a wall in your apartment, I do believe. I think I took down one of your accumulated paintings, uh, and, and we just used the wall. Uh, but I just had come from this, this challenging thing to something where I felt like I was, you meet people, and you're, you and me a little bit too, actually. You meet someone, you're like, oh, they're old friends instantly. You kind of have that. I was like, you know what? They had this moment. It's, it's, it's lovely. They have this lovely story. It was really fun to sort of sit with them and, and have that, and I just wanted to kind of show it off a little bit. So they get to be the special exception. Let me, if, may I add, there is something unique about me, and it pertains to color and white. You see, we had a dreadful time in Europe uh, during the war, clearly, and we'll get into it perhaps later, and if you don't, you can get a free copy of my book by simply downloading it. Um, and even after the war, my dad was taken to Siberia by the Soviets. And my brother and I, he was on my back. He was two years old. I was 11. Walked across Europe. We were headed to Palestine before there was an Israel. Uh, my dad broke out of prison, tracked us down. And there's a lot more detail I'm skipping. But the, the point I'm getting to you is Finally, finally, we got airfare to take us to New York. And the reason why we could do that is because my dad was a diplomat under Polish government. And when he was arrested, he had a diplomatic passport. My mother had the presence of mind to secrete the passports. And that's how we came to the United States. Now, clearly, you look at me. And by the way, the government knows this, so I have no fear in telling you. But I came here illegally because the passports I came on were void. Because the moment he was arrested, diplomatic passports were void. But the point is, I, I was 11 years, almost 12. And Europe, it was when I came here, there were few, if any, lights. And we came here to the United States about 10 o'clock at night. And I still tell you, we came on an American Airlines flight. Two seats on each side, small airplanes. And I remember looking at the window, and the colors out the window were very similar to the color of the ceiling behind you, with the illuminated ceiling. And I looked at that kind of a whitish color, and I couldn't understand what it was. And whoever was the person sitting, sitting on my right could still tell you what side of the aisle we sat on. I draped over him or her, looking out the window, and there was a white sky. Now, how can you have a white sky 
in the middle of 10 o'clock at night. This is, this is January. And I couldn't believe it while well, we were flying into New York City. And the lights in the United States were already on. And over Manhattan, the sky is white. And I like to say to this day, when I came to the United States, I came from dark into the light. And so I think, before I was even able to tell the story, this man kept, kept, captured that. That adds so much more to the portrait of you and Lori hanging in the gallery downstairs. Yeah. That is lovely. Now you understand why I have such a respect for him. The A can read minds, apparently. No, I knew the story. That, so the story that he, I, that he just told is actually like the official line I give curators. Um, so what you, when curators ask me, they, they usually want, Craig's not here, right? I, I saw Craig slip out for a second. Uh, oh, sorry, Craig. Uh, so I, I usually, they, they usually want some sort of deep meaning to it, and I usually give that as the story, but the real reason is a little more emotional, a little more personal. But I usually give, because the blanket of light is in the story that I wrote about it for the book, too. Uh, Andy was 20 months old when we started walking. We walked probably for two or three months. You were and, how old? Just a second. I'm getting, I'm getting there. <laughs> She's tough. She's married to me. Gotta be. <laughs> it was, this was in second half of 46. I was born in 1935, April 35. I was 10 and a half, more or less. So and I had this monkey on my back. Oh. <laughs> no, I had to be 11 and a half, excuse me, because there was nine and a half years difference between us. So it would appear. Uh, 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 we, are, we will have questions afterwards, folks, and we will ask you to use the microphone so that the folks Sorry. at home can hear. Um, it would appear that this book is about the Holocaust, but B.A. makes a point of saying this isn't about the Holocaust. So. Talk about that dichotomy, B.A., and Alan, jump in. The, the, the very first sentence of the book is, no matter how it may seem, this is not a book about the Holocaust. And then a little later, I correct myself and say, no matter what I tell you, it is a book about the Holocaust. Um, there's, there's a universality to it. You know, I didn't come to it from uh, sort of the background of uh, a personal deep connection to the Holocaust. I didn't have any personal connections to the Holocaust when I started. Now I've got 140. But when I started, that wasn't really the motivation for me. I wanted to explore overcoming. And I wanted to explore um, sort of what, what it looks like to move past trauma. We all have trauma in our lives. Everybody does, um, to different extents. Uh, sometimes they're generational. Sometimes they're personal. Everyone has something that has scarred them. And I was very interested in exploring a, a class of people who had sort of the, a, a similar set of scars and how they had, had moved, I won't say moved past, but had moved forward um, with that scar as, a, as an instrument, as an educational instrument to other folks. I want somebody who is going through a miscarriage, a divorce, somebody who is, has lost their job to say, do the same thing that I did in the pandemic and say, well, now I know these folks and they were 11 years old walking across Europe and let's, let's make it uphill, barefoot in the snow or whatever. But, fundam but fundamentally, you can, you can um, see how other folks were able to overcome and also create generational success, which is especially important in America where not everyone starts from the same great starting spot. And you want to think about, well, how can you move forward and upward? How can you give to your kids an easier time than, than you had? your grandkids an easier time than they had, et cetera. And there's ways to talk about that. And it's a really good uh, instrument for creating that because you can't come from really less than walking alone across Europe after your family has gone and been through camps or hiding in a building or whatnot. And so that, that it, it provides sort of a, a good reference point. Let me just tell you, pick up on that. We came to the United States with $42 and I have no idea how my parents ever got the $42. With $42, without language, and with me, with not a single day in, cl in a class. 
And as you go downstairs and read the, uh, some of the descriptions of the other Holocaust, you'll see that I'm not at all unique. I only, and I say this only, have two degrees. Many of the people downstairs have three and more. Mm -hmm. We can't, and, and look, it, it's very simple. I could not, I'm speaking for myself, find parents who had money or had status. Because even the Jewish community shunned us. We had no status. The only thing I could do is get an education and use that education. And so in a matter of a year and a half, I was able to learn English, sufi sufficiently so, to where I was almost on grade level. In a year and a half, I learned how to read and write, because I had to. Uh, in a year and a half, I got the rudiments of mathematics, because again, I'd never been to a classroom before. I had no choice. But you see, we were driven, we were frightened, because the, the prospect of failure was starving on the street. And so when, then I went off to college, and in college, for the first time, I became aware, aware of the fact that psychologically I was damaged. And I have been to, to shrinks of various types, social workers, um, psychologists, and the whole uh, counselors, the whole array, for as long as a year and a half on some occasions and others just a year, just a day. And, but the emphasis was work hard, work hard, work. There was no choice. And so much so by the end of 10th grade, and I'm not that smart. I was a, I was a member of the National Honor Society. <laughs> not that smart, but driven. And if you look at those people downstairs, you just generally see that, that am I correct? I would be absolutely correct, yes. Absolutely correct. Something else I noticed about a lot of the photos, BA, is that many of them are a photo of a survivor and a loved one. Mm -hmm. What drew you to that composition? When I could get away with it, uh, I would <laughs> photograph, no, I, I would ask everybody, and there was a pretty common reply. I would say I want to photograph somebody with a grandchild or a great-grandchild, in one case a great-great-grandchild who's been born. Uh, and it was important to me because the, the, I, I had the title of the book before I made the first picture. The title of the book comes from a Yehuda Amakai poem. I'm, I'm a big lover of poetry. And, uh, I liked the idea of exploring what invitation to life in whatever way it might be looked like. And fundamentally, because folks survived, future generations survived. And this is especially true of all trauma, right? If you're, if you're in America, you have Native Americans here because their ancestors survived. You have black folks here because their ancestors overcame unbelievable things. Coming through the Holocaust, same exact thing. And so I wanted to show that, yes, they'd survived, but also other lives, numerous as the stars, had come into being because of their survival. The big press that I, that I came against was that a lot of the survivors would come back and say, that's great, do you know how much trouble I'm in if I pick only one grandkid? <laughs> and so, so if, if, if you see um, ones that have grand, grandkids, it's usually because they were uh, just impolite enough to include somebody and exclude somebody else. Um, Alan, you said something, I, I loved reading the essay that went along with your photo, but you talk about the concept of um, tikkun olam, and we've just concluded the celebration of, of Yom Kippur, and I'm going to ask you, how does that concept fit with one of the Jewish high holy days, and how do you think tikkun olam works with invited to life? Like this. You see, on Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur we Jews are supposed to uh, ask for forgiveness, shed ourselves of sin, which means uh, with, with forgiveness or not, I have a problem with that. But anyway, the point is trying to become better people. That's what Kippur stands for. The attempt to become, to jettison our wrong ways and become better people. And when we become better people, Tikkun Olam is natural. Nikon alone means building a better, just, compassionate world. So at the end of Yom Kippur, 
That's what we're supposed to be doing. And that, the place where I have difficulty, Yom Kippur, that's so as you understand, I am a firm believer that in 365 days, or as the case may be, 366 days, every day is a Yom Kippur. That's what I believe. And so I try to do the right thing, and I try to live to come along every day of the year. And B.A., how does that fit with the book, would you say? I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to hijack your whole event for a second to tell a story. I'm you sorry about it. <laughs> my, it's my favorite Yom Kippur story. I've, I've spent most of my adult life as a travel journalist, and I'm a, I'm a good Jew two days a year, and one of them is Yom Kippur. <laughs> and um, a couple years ago, I was flying back from Mongolia on Yom Kippur. And the rule is you've got to start fasting at sunset the night before and go all the way through until you see three stars in the sky the next day. The problem is I was flying back from Mongolia. With the time zone changes, my Yom Kippur was going to be 40 hours long. And so I called up five rabbis who I do, five different ones, all hoping they would give me a favorable response, and none of them did. And they also basically said, you've got to take your lumps and sit there, very hungry on a plane for 40 hours. Uh, but one of them managed to find, there's a, there's a book of specific rabbinical rulings from the modern age and things like that come up now about you know, what happens if you're flying back from Mongolia or whatnot. And he sent me over like the PDF of it. And one, one of them was, you know, if you're traveling by airplane on a long flight, here's what you gotta do, et cetera. But the one right after it was, and I'm sorry again for hijacking, the one after, right after it was, question was, what do you do on Yom Kippur if you're a Jew and you go to the moon? And it was written in 1969 when there was a possibility that might be a problem. And there's like, oh, well, we're sending folks to the moon. At some point, somebody's gonna bring a yarmulke with them. And so, and so, uh, the actual ruling was, question, you know, what, what do you do if you're a Jew and you go to the moon on Yom Kippur? Answer, first of all, if you're Jewish, don't go to the moon. <laughs> all right, anyway, so, um, so how do I think it fits? Um, I found, generally speaking, with the vast majority of the survivors who I spoke with, there were certain universal values. There's an absolutely universal value of... Um, a strong push for social justice and racial tolerance. And I don't say that coming from any particular political bias of my own, just something I'd observed. Um, I, you see a very, very strong altruistic sensibility that extends beyond their own families. But more importantly than that, um, the professions that so many of the survivors I met were driven to, which are so clearly responses to their trauma. So many psychologists, so many psychiatrists, so many artists, so many people who are reaching out, trying to make the world a little bit better around them, coming from their own viewpoint. The, the story I like to tell is a survivor in California named Ruhl Artal, uh, like Alan, he's using a phony name. And so he, uh, he's out in California, and he was the young, he's the youngest survivor there is in the world. He was born only a few months before the uh, camp was liberated that he, his mother was in. She was pregnant, they hid the pregnancy from the guards, they hid her for the birth, they covered the door jams, the walls with pillows so that no one would hear her screaming during the labor, and she gave birth three weeks before they were liberated from the camp that they were in. And he spent his entire life as an OBGYN specializing in challenged childbirths. There's a universality to it. Um, and the idea of tikkun olam, whether you want to consider it being personal or, or larger, you can't repair the whole world. No one can repair the whole world. But you can repair your little corner of it. You Excellent. can work as a counselor, fixing relationships because you know the, what that matters. If you have the power to make a book, you can write a book. You, know, you can do those things. And that's something that I found that was very universal to the experience and something that I certainly think um, was part of my experience. You and I have talked about this a lot, the, the idea that uh, I wrote a book in which I'm very much a character. That I'm very much a character in my life. There's no way around it. And part of that is because I wanted all the folks who are reading it to have the experience that I had of meeting survivors and, and learning from them. And it repaired me. Maybe it can repair them a little bit too. It's a wonderful way to take this little... This, not this little thing, but this thing that Alan said that you recorded in his essay. And I see that throughout the entire book. 
And Alan, you and Lori turned it into a profession. Well, we did it in several ways. For example, uh, in my construction work, I took a great deal of pleasure, and my focus was on building housing for low and moderate income families. I st I'm still involved with it, and I've been retired for 26 years, 28 years. Mm -hmm. I still sit in a committee in Miami where we hand out money to developers to build low income housing. Uh, in my law practice, I realized representing corporations was okay, it brought the bread home, but it sure was neat, it was much more fun to represent a person who was struggling against a company, against the government, against whatever. So that was, that was, and then Lori, the best part of our joint practice, we did divorce mediation. A couple came to us in great discord and distress, and, uh, and we, we would sit down at a round table, so there's nobody ahead of the table. They, after listening to us for a while, would sit, would select who wanted to be represented by Lori versus myself. And there's a, there's a pattern to that. We'll talk to you afterwards when we sit down and with any of you individually, if you're interested. And uh, then we started a divorce mediation. About half of the time, we were able to resolve the entire thing for a small pittance of what it would cost for a typical divorce. And in addition to that, our purpose was to make sure that the family survived and rather than being torn into shreds as in most divorces. Uh, and Lori says this very well, she says, the marriage does not last but the family lasts mm. for, forever. Uh, and that was the, the essence. The, the point is, even in the worst of times, we tried to create a reasonably good situation. We weren't always successful, but the interesting part, even in the cases where we were, didn't take it all the way to the end, people came back to us later on and say, I did 50, I got half of the issues resolved with you all. I did 90% of the issues with them, and then the other 10% we use it, the lawyers to do war. And so it's, it, it's probably the most satisfying part of our practice of law. Mm -hmm. EA, were there any people that you interviewed that you could not include in the book? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's 90, uh, portraits in the book. I did about 140 total. Uh, so there's 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 50 people who I disappointed, and they call me and they write me. <laughs> um, but there there was there were folks who I excluded because I thought maybe the photograph wasn't as good, or especially because I couldn't. And I'll admit this deficit in myself couldn't necessarily tell the story as well. Mm -hmm. um, there there's there were only so many ways that I could find. A lot of times, a lot of people's joy had been, I, I came and I, I might have been a housewife and had a family. There's only so, ways, so many ways that I, from my own lens, could find compelling ways to tell that story. And that's, that's my, my own fault, my own deficit. There were, there were five people who did, uh, when, when the book was uh, being put together, um, I contracted with a museum to help me do some vetting, make sure there was some fact checking on the stories or whatnot. And there were five survivors who, who did, whose stories uh, didn't, uh, past the qualities needed to put them into a book. Um, and then there were uh, just a few where you know, I, I wanted to make some concessions for, um, I guess you would call it diversity. You know, the, uh, the, uh, there are survivors in this book, quite a few survivors in this book who were not Jewish. Uh, the Holocaust was not solely a Jewish experience. Um, their their um, life experiences after the war mimic exactly the, uh, the, the Jewish survivor's experiences. Uh, but uh, I would try and include folks who are from various Jewish backgrounds, various countries. I would try and include folks who had a, a variety of experience both in the war and afterwards. So I'd try and, and, and make that flexible as well. And then there were some where just, you know, the, the story didn't quite uh, manage to be verified and I just couldn't quite include it. It looks like we have a few folks who might have some questions for us. 
So I'm going to ask you, if you do have a question, please use the microphone. It's going to be easier for the recording and the folks who are watching to hear what your question is. So please approach the mic and ask B.A. and Alan any questions you may have. And if you are watching this on the library's live stream, please put your question in the chat and we will make sure it's responded to by Alan or B.A. We do have a couple of comments, actually not questions from our online viewers. Um, one, I'm so moved uh, by Hall's philosophy of living every day as a Yom Kippur. Mm. Um, and Hall exudes the highest possible values of being human. So awe-inspiring. So not questions, but profound. So I brought my age and you brought yours. <laughs> <laughs> Profound observations. My brother is deceased, so who are you? <laughs> As a spouse, I would like you to tell how you came to the United States, how you came to the United States um, in terms of legality and what your granddaughter is doing now. I can say this to her because she's married to me. <laughs> you weren't listening. I told her. <laughs> I came unlawfully, and I am proud to tell you, I don't brag ordinarily, but as a grandfather, if I have grandchildren, I will brag. <laughs> My granddaughter is a Yale and Harvard graduate, and she is now working as a lawyer in the White House. Now, for somebody who came here unlawfully, this is my granddaughter, and I am higher than a kite. Thank you for the question. So, Alan, my question is, let me clarify, you've kind of like told your story in bits and pieces. Your father was sent to Russia. You walked with your brother and your mother. So. Okay, so, but it sounds like your family ended up all coming back together. So your family all made it through the concentration camps and were, okay. So could you clarify your mom and your dad and your brother? Sure. How many hours do you have? <laughs> uh, I'll try to make it brief. Uh, during the war, the first thing my dad did is he had a rhinoplasty to make him like less Jewish. He went into the bathroom as a brunette, came out as a blonde. He spoke brilliant German because he was educated in Vienna. And so he was able to pass as a, not a Nazi, but a Viennese. I can know that. And so uh, we, as I told you, we hid, I'm, I'm not sure I told you this or not. At first we, we hid in a, war, in a Lvov ghetto, and then subsequently, we, we were uh, hidden in a theater above a ceiling, suspended ceiling, like this, like that. And then when we were discovered there, we hid in a sub-basement behind a underneath the factory. And finally, we used, uh, and this was all together with my family. We, uh, we hid in plain sight, titled my book, with under false identification papers as Christians. Uh, this was all with my family. Twice I was caught. Each time I was marked for immediate uh, execution. I was waiting in for a train to Treblinka. By the way, for those of you who might not know, Treblinka was a murder factory. It was not a concentration camp. And as a matter of fact, there were no dining facilities there. There were no sleeping facilities there. So when you came to Treblinka, you went straight to gas chambers, zero survivors. I was waiting on a train to be taken there. Uh, they took me to the uh, orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto. At any rate, this goes on and on. Uh, you, gotta, you, you can't buy the book if you get it for free. <laughs> uh, anyway, after the war, my dad was arrested by the Soviets. He was dragged off, sent to Siberia. My mother knew that he would try to escape. She just knew that's, that's the way he was. She waited for him and she put my brother on my back and said, go to Palestine. We did the best we could to avoid any authorities. I changed my name 
every time I went to a different camp. And uh, they knew that there was something that was unique about us. They knew I would never abandon my two-year-old brother. So they were looking for two children traveling together. They knew pretty much the path that we were going on. And they finally found us by just checking records upon records upon records. And thank, because my brother was taken to a hospital, we were standing still for about a month and a half. During that time, they, they swooped down, got a hold of us, and now we were back together again because my dad escaped from Siberia, uh, actually from the train going to Siberia. We wound up in Paris. We waited there for five months. And we, thanks to my two uncles in New York, wound up with a ticket to go to um, LaGuardia. We landed in LaGuardia and as a family of four and basically started living in Newburgh, New York, 60 miles up from the city. Did I answer your question? By the way, one thing I'd like to mention to you that is, it is part of my DNA to this day. My wife will tell you, there is nothing that is more important than my family. That just, that's the alpha omega of my life. Thank you for your question. I have an online question, Katie. Oh. Uh, for BA, is there a story that you didn't put in the book that was memorable? And if so, can you share it? The answer was, is there a story in the book that was, is, this, is there a person who I met was memorable, but I couldn't put the story in, and would I share it? Correct. The answers are yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> well, kidding aside. Uh, so yeah, there were, there was, there was lots. Um, uh, should we, no, let's just do it, it's fine. Um, so there, there, was, there was one, that, that sticks out, which is a person who uh, was not uh, actually a Holocaust survivor. The story was made up and knew it at the time. Knew when I was sitting there. Uh, they did not survive the vetting. Uh, they, they hilariously did not survive the vetting the, 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 um, uh, the researchers had done. And uh, uh, it's a shame because it was a colorful story, as you know, that, that can often be. Um, it was absolutely. Uh, heartbreaking in the doing of it, because uh, it's hard to talk about. Uh, it's upsetting to talk about, uh, because it undercuts these very, very real stories. And so that was, that was very challenging. Um, and without getting into any more details on that particularly, mostly because I, I, I don't feel it's c quite correct for me to do so, um, you know, that's, that's certainly one that is memorable that uh, that was excluded. The trade-off of that, though, is that, you know, we put we put X number of stories through, and everything else was absolutely perfectly correct. You need a little pain in life to understand the poetry of it. You need rainy days to remember sunny ones. And so, fundamentally, having a couple bad apples makes it a little easier to remember that the other many, many stories that I got to carry forward as perfume among the perishing were good and right and worthwhile and necessary. So that's the trade-off. Are there yeah. a lot of Holocaust impersonators? I don't think so. The question was, are there a lot of Holocaust impersonators? Yeah. I doubt it. I doubt it very much. And also, you have to remember, in, in my own personal opinion, I think it's partially, we're in the year 2023. Most folks who, who would, would claim that status now were children during the war memories and the best of us is infallible. He and I told you two very different stories something that happened three years ago, right? They're both accurate to us. Memory, you know, so fundamentally, I think it's very plausible that grains of something that was true become larger, um, that, that it feels very real to them. So I, I, my, my actual estimation is that the stories that aren't accurate, percentage-wise, are infinitesimal, truly small. There's one thing that he said I'd like to mention. When I was getting dressed here, I knew fully well, and actually I brought these with me, that I, I, I was initially going to wear a black suit to come here with a white shirt. And then I thought about it and thought, no, nah, no, nah, that's not what I want to do. 
And he said, you've got to have rainy days to appreciate the sunny days. I wore these socks on purpose. <laughs> really? No, 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 no. It's important that in the worst of stories, in the blackest of times, in the worst of times, during the Holocaust, every night, my mother would say, we won. Now, we were in a closet. We were in a closet. And she would say, we won. We didn't have food. We won. We had to do our business at a party and put a newspaper or something on top for the aroma. We won. We beat Hitler that day. We were still alive. And so to this day, I carry forward that notion that when we talk about the worst of times and the worst of things, there is hope. And that's why I wear the socks that I do. That is a lovely note on which to end this fantastic evening. Thank you all so much for coming to hear B.A. Van Sice and Alan J. Hall talk about Invited to Life. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for a wonderful evening. This has been marvelous. Thank you. And it went in so many different directions. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you.